Well, good morning in the West, good afternoon in the East. Thanks for joining us today. My name is Jake Milstein, and we are here for an urgent panel webinar to talk about the uh, cyber attack on change healthcare. And, you know, I, I see, you know, from folks who are joining, you know, every, you know, a lot of folks at hospitals, at clinics, uh, at business associates, um, you know, everybody has uh, uh, at least seen the effects of this, even if it hasn't affected your organization uh, specifically. Um, and so we're going to talk about what the effects are. We're going to talk about the latest news. And boy, have things uh, changed maybe in the last 24, 48 hours. So we're going to we're going to talk through that. Um, if you haven't been to our webinars before, a uh, couple of quick uh, housekeeping notes here. Number one is there is a chat on the right. Um, if it's dinging for you, there's a little bell at the top and you can click it to make it stop uh, binging, binging uh, so you can mute it. Um, everybody who has registered will get a recording of this um, and we will uh, send out the slide deck to, uh, to folks who want it. Um, we're, uh, um, the recording is sent automatically and we'll also put it on our YouTube page uh, by tomorrow so folks can view it there as well. Um, and I see folks in the chat right now. Uh, telling us where they're joining from. Um, if uh, uh, if anyone's having trouble with the platform, you can't see anything or hear anything. Do a uh, do a refresh. Um, you know the old F five, and that should uh, and that should do it. Um, and joining with Chrome is better than joining with another browser. Um, okay, who are we? So Critical Insight is a preferred cybersecurity provider for the American Hospital Association, as well as Idaho, Kansas, Missouri. Uh, Minnesota uh, and North Dakota, and I see a lot of our friends there in the in the chat. Um, from the American Hospital Association, joining us today is John Rigi, who's the National uh, Cyber and Risk Advisor. Um, and uh, John uh, has some really unique insights on this today, and we're really excited to have him. Uh, Tim Powers, uh, CFO of Idaho Hospital Association, previously CEO of a hospital in. Um, Nevada, and he's been hearing from folks around Idaho. Um, Nathan Wright is the VP of IT at United Derm Partners, uh, which uh, is uh, obviously feeling the effects of the attack, and he's going to talk about there. Um, Fred, Mike, and I all work at Critical Insight. Fred and Mike founded the company, uh, and I host our events um, and uh, run uh, and run marketing. All right. Well, let's uh, let's get into it. And remember, folks, please use the chat if you have questions as we go. Um, uh, put them in the chat. I love interrupt, inter interrupting the conversation to answer questions or answering them in the chat. So, um, uh, yeah, please use the chat for, for anything that comes up. Okay. So what happened? So the way we start our urgent panels is, okay, here's what happened. Here's how we got here. So this all started on the 21st of February. Um, Change Healthcare Group discovered a breach, isolated it, and disconnected impacted systems. That meant tools for payment and rev cycle management, um, which is 14 billion transactions a year, um, became unavailable and affiliates started having cash problems. Um, over 90% of the nation's pharmacies were disrupted. Uh, the, the change COO a few days later then said, you know, the outage may last for weeks. Um, on the 29th, um, the uh, CISA, uh, circulated actionable steps for affected organizations. We'll share that link uh, in a little bit if you haven't seen it. Uh, Black Cat Gang confirmed as the criminal gang. Um, Optum, which owns Change, offered temporary funding assistance. Um, AHA sent a letter to Congress suggesting that assistance will not come close to meeting the needs of members. Then on March 1st, uh, United Healthcare, um, which owns Change Optum, um, you know, had created a website with uh, information. And then on March 4th, AHA urged HHS to use all available authority to ensure continuity of physician services. And the AHA urged Congress to provide support to help minimize further fallout from change. Now, what I'm going to get to in a minute is what has happened since then, because there are rumors and there are reports about whether change paid a ransom and we're going to get to that in a second but i want to dig in to some of the things that are on this page first nathan i want to start with you the at the very beginning rev cycle you know uh disrupted what what happened what happened to you all so from from an organization perspective obviously you know claims and payments is a a huge part 
um, of the rev cycle and operations for any clinic, you know, specialty specific like we are or otherwise. Um, and so, um, so it was, it was immediately impactful um, and, you know, significantly impactful for us. Um, I think, I think in the beginning when you know exactly what's going on, you know, the, the thing is, how do you figure out what's going on to then lead into what you need to do about it? Um, and I'll say, I'm sure this will come up, right? But from my perspective, you know, both operationally and from a security perspective, like we're obviously connected to change. We send a lot of information through change. So from a security perspective, it was trying to find out, you know, how were they effective? What do we know? How could that potentially bleed over into our organization um, and you know what should we change do differently implement um, to harden our environment you know even further from a and, security perspective and nathan in the very beginning how did you hear about it did change contact you or how did you all find out so i would say the way that we found out is that stuff stopped working <laughs> um and you know, we'll get into this too, but but your your partnerships with third parties, right? Um, your relationships with those sort of key people, um, you know, that was that was our first reach out, right? Like, hey, this is not working. And in the beginning, you're like, ah, oh, do I need to open a support ticket, right? Like, is this going to come back up? Well, we quickly realized that this was something bigger than that, um, and so we we were actually. I guess lucky maybe in the sense that our key vendor our you know billing system right actually had pretty close relationships with change so they were able to figure out you know pretty quickly what was going on and they were very open um, and communicative to us and our leadership team um, as we started you know started to figure out what was going on but the short answer to your question is you know things basically stopped working and so we followed our normal procedures and that quickly escalated into what we know now. And Tim, you know, for Idaho hospitals, is that is that a similar story to what you're hearing there? Yeah, uh, it depends on the size of the system, the location, but very similar uh, experiences here in the state of Idaho, for sure. And so and the impacts in Idaho have been uh, far and wide. Yes. What um, what are you <clears throat> what are you hearing from hospitals there in terms of what they're doing? Um, you know, not to belabor the point, but I was just uh, recently finished up a Idaho chapter HFMA conference here in Boise, and some of the chatter around there was, uh, you know, how this one particular instant we're so vulnerable, right, uh, with this one entity, and how the the ramifications of that cascaded all over the country. And um, I think it's just, it just goes to the, uh, the fact that we're very fragile and the fragility of our, our networks, our IT security and how that translates into providing care is very interconnected. And uh, it's, you know, it's it, the, uh, the consequences of, of things like this um, just keep cascading out, uh, Jake. And it's uh, uh, it it goes back to bringing back really bad memories that I have of experience of being right on the the uh, the front, experiencing all of the uh, all of the impacts of a ransomware attack. Yeah, no no fun at all. And John, so you've been at the the. Um, I don't want to say the center of all of this, but I mean, you know, people have been calling you since this, this all started, um, you know, where, you know, how did it start? You know, how, how did you hear it started? And then can you tell us a little bit about what's developed in terms of the letters that AHA have sent and the actions AHA is taking? Sure. Uh, so on February 21st, we did receive a couple of disparate independent reports from the field that there was a problem change healthcare and that their systems appeared to be down and um, they had been down since about 2 15 a.m according to this website and so i received probably notification about noon and we started looking at that pretty closely and we were trying to understand as well what 
what the issue was, but also realized very quickly that an attack on change would have a systemic effect. So about that time, we're calling the, I'm calling the health ISAC, and uh, we see the 2.09 uh, p.m. Eastern Standard Time notice from change indicating that they were experiencing in, in some a cyber threat, so a cybersecurity issue, outside threat, and that in order to protect uh, their customers and patients, they had disconnected their systems. So I'm reading that, and then based on my experience, I'm saying ransomware attack very significant and it's down for 12 hours. So I've been involved in investigating ransomware attacks probably since 2014, but certainly every hospital when I was at FBI and then every hospital attack since 2018, I've looked at, spoke with the victims directly or helped them through the attack. So at that point, I started call, make calls to the leadership of FBI, uh, cyber leadership, FBI, leadership of HHS and CISA. And we were the first ones to notify them of this issue that could have national impact, systemic attack impact. And uh, they started to look at it. And then again, as the updates came out indicating no timeline for restoration, uh, we issued some initial guidance indicating organizations should consider disconnection from optum change systems until we understand what's going on. We know, ultimately, we know, unfortunately, from very hard lessons learned, it's much easier to disconnect temporarily until we understand what's going on and then reconnect quickly once we get the all clear rather than suffer a ransomware attack. So it became pretty evident. Uh, then they had the call the next night that they talked about a uh, sophisticated change. Universal Optum had that customer call the following evening that they had a sophisticated nation state adversary that had attacked them. Um, that point, I think, remains debatable uh, what the nature of this group is that sub ultimately was identified as Black Cat ransomware group, Russian speaking, certainly supported by Russia in the sense that they allow them to operate in their territory, passive support, but we would not say that they are actively supported. And I just don't think we have the information out there that to indicate that the Russian government was somehow involved in the direction of this attack or the Russian intelligence service was involved. Uh, so it became pretty clear that the initial disruptions were around pharmacy, uh, patient authorizations, and of course, revenue cycle. And we were very concerned about first and foremost, interruption, delay of patient care, uh, patient care, which ultimately would create a risk to patient safety. And as time uh, went on, we are understanding really that the primary disruption now involves revenue cycle, submission of claims and reimbursements. So we think, although we, we still hear anecdotal reports of pharmacy disruptions, um, we think at this point, direct patient care, not in jeopardy. However, as, as everybody's pointing out, if you can't pay doctors, if you can't pay for services, patient care will be adversely impacted the longer this goes on. We're not hearing a timeline for restoration that, that has its own implications, uh, which this would probably extend uh, for some time. Our letters, of course, we are bringing this attention. We've done a lot of media, a lot of briefings, but it's hard for the general public to understand the impact of this systemic attack. You know, the, the analogy I just used a short while ago in speaking to my boss, it's like a volcano that's exploded in the distance. We all saw it. We all see it. We see the lava coming down the mountain. I'm not sure where it's going to go. We know there's a village in the way. There's a town, a city. Depends which way that lava goes. But we know it's dangerous, but we just haven't seen the full impact. But it's coming. It's like a slow rolling disaster. And, um, you know, the consolidation of UHG, Change, and Optum has created, in essence, whether by design or default, a utility, a payment utility for the sector. So we have this concentration of mission critical services, but that does in fact create concentrated risk for the entire sector if those services suddenly become unavailable, such as during a ransomware attack. And we need to really think hard about that. Um, 
you know, full transparency, the, um, the AHA was concerned when the, the merger occurred. We did ask, uh, DOJ did initiate an antitrust uh, procedure, which they were not successful for. But again, part of it was the risk to the sector. When you get that big in every hospital in the country, touches and depends on change for one way or another, there has to be some special considerations for their cybersecurity, just as we have for utilities throughout any sector, for major banks that require stress testing uh, periodically to ensure the safety and security of the entire sector. So where we are right now, let's fast forward. No timeline for restoration. My personal opinion is this will go on for a number of weeks at least, just because we do not have a timeline from them, uh, knowing how complex it is to decrypt networks, uh, assuming that they have access to some tool maybe to decrypt. We don't know if they've paid a ransom or not. Um, the claims on the dark web from purported to be from Black Cat Alfie, we don't know. We don't know exactly what that means. And it's a it's a it's a murky world filled oh, with mirrors. And and so I want to get to that here, um, and then we're going to go back and touch on a lot of the things you said yeah. there about consolidation. And I also want to talk about uh, the the thing that United has done. Um, by the way, I do want to make clear that Nathan's group, United Derm, is not related to United Healthcare. Um, and the things they've done, like say, yeah, you can file a claim with us, and we're going to get back to that in a second. So th this report is what John's talking about. This came out over the weekend. It's just a report. We are not confirming that change paid the ransom, uh, paid the ransom. Quite the opposite. Um, so it says hackers behind the change healthcare ransom just received a $22 million payment because uh, you know people looked at Bitcoin's blockchain and saw that a ransom was paid. And then, Mike, can you tell people what this is? Sure. Uh, well, it, it doesn't say that a ransom was paid. It says that $22 million was moved, okay? And so we don't know that that is change paying the gang. Uh, but now we have this drama with uh, one of the affiliate groups. So remember, ALFV is a, um, a provider of infrastructure and tools for affiliates to use, and they take a cut. That's how their criminal corporation works. So here's this affiliate, and what they're saying is ALFV pretended that they had been taken down by the FBI, cashed out the wallet with the $22 million in it and then rolled up the, uh, rolled up the, the carpet and disappeared. So this is known as an exit scam. Um, this is what they have on their dark web leak site right now. And the department of justice has said, Nope, we didn't do that. So murky, <laughs> as John said, is exactly the way this looks right now. Who can we believe? Who should we believe? Probably no one. And I don't think we really have gotten to the bottom of this yet. We don't know that change actually paid a ransom. We don't know that somebody actually stole the affiliates money and then pretended to be taken down by the DOJ. There seems to be a lot of, you know, potentially disinformation flying around. And uh, I think it's just going to take a little more time to find out exactly what happened here. And, and, and John, I think you've said over, over years, we can't trust criminals here. That would be a very good premise to start with. You can't trust them. Um, and ultimately, again, the piece about disinformation, this could be all part of a scam for somebody to steal more money, make a higher ransom demand. It's, it's murky and it's a hall of mirrors at the same time. And we don't know even if there are foreign uh, other entities who might be trying to create disinformation to discredit this group so that people won't deal with them. Uh, you know, and I have no indication if the government's doing this or some other foreign intelligence service. There's all types of motivations for people to put up false information like this. And John, I I do want to get back to something you said before about the um about what AHA has said. So change, you know, change came out <clears throat> and said, um, and actually I'm going to start with Nathan on this, then I'll go back to you. Change came out and said, hey, we're going to pay claims for folks, um, uh, you know, and set up their website. Uh, Nathan, what you what'd you make of that? 
So, you know, initially it was just a very generic thing, right? Which, which was good in the sense of, hey, it seemed like a pretty quick turnaround, right? That they're going to make some funding available. You know, we're, we're, you know, sort of exploring and seeking all options um, in those areas. And, you know, what we discovered was when we followed that process, you know, and got into the, to the program to see, you know, what our sort of estimated reimbursements would be and that kind of thing. It was, um, it was a far cry lower than what we were even expecting under, you know, with, with a conservative, a conservative approach, because that was part of our conversations as well, right? Like if, you know, if, if our revenue at this organizational size is X, right? Like, and there's 14 billion transactions a year going through this, like how could, how could Optum even temporarily, right? Move that much cash around as part of this program, but you know, you maintain hope, right? That it's somewhere in the middle of that. Um, but again, you know, I guess the devil's in the details because when we got in there and looked at that, we were just like, this is, this is not even, you know, like a drop in the bucket, right? It's the total like opposite of what you kind of said in a, in a, uh, a larger initial communication. Yeah. And, and John, you know, I know AHA has sent some, some pointed notes, um, both, you know, to the federal government and about this, what, what, what are you all seeing? Just exactly confirming what Nathan said. Our concern is that the, that the actual dollar amounts that or healthcare providers would qualify were far less than the loss that they were experiencing, the revenue interruption, 10% or less or less of what they uh, actually, 10% uh, or less is what United was offering for their lost revenue at this point. Plus there was some very onerous uh, terms and conditions uh, attached to accepting a loan from them, such as waiver of any future claims of liability. Um, again, we don't know if data was stolen. We don't know, again, the ultimate loss organizations would face. Uh, the access to data, large amounts of data would have to be um, given, uh, United would have to be given access to, for example, and uh, repayment of the loan within five days of receiving notice. So some very, very, very onerous conditions, even though I've had even our general counsel say if he was an independent lawyer mm -hmm. and saw that, he would not advise anybody to sign that. But again, folks have to make their own decision, but we felt, that, again, it was misrepresented from their public statements, as Nathan said. And we've made Congress and the administration aware of that. And we've also uh, sent direct letters to the leadership of United Health Group as well. And, you know, Fred, I want to bring you in here uh, because there are a lot of questions in the chat about how this whole thing started. Like, do we know how the bad guys got into change do we there's been all sorts of back and forth about that you know should there did they have backups did the backups not work like what i mean this is a giant organization you would think that they would do all of the things that you and john and mike say on webinars all the time yeah and, and it's quite likely that they did the initial uh news was that they were taking advantage of the connect wise vulnerability or remote access vulnerability they rapidly responded and said, no, that is not how we uh, we gained access. And if you look at the CISA page, the Stop, Stop Alpha V ransomware page, which is a treasure trove, and we have a link later, it goes into all of the techniques that they've always talked about that particular gang using, and it usually leads with social engineering. So if you look at what the government has published, it is a detailed list of tactics, techniques, and procedures that ALF V uses. And I would focus on that content because that's more likely it, it fits their MO. It's the approach they normally use. And if you look at the indicators of compromise, it tends to, to show the types of things that we'd expect from a more sophisticated attack rather than just taking advantage of a singular vulnerability. And on the backups, um, the one thing also that you will learn uh, that uh, gang has extended their capabilities to both virtual machines, VMware hypervisors, Linux boxes, as well as Windows machines. My feeling is this was a true, complete across the board ransomware attack. That's pure speculation. We don't know. 
but that would seem quite logical with the several weeks uh, for recovery and that the breadth, if you looked at the published page where uh, change is saying, here are the systems that are up, it's a very short list, and here are the dozens of systems that are still down, that it shows the breadth and depth of this attack was enterprise-wide. So I think this is at a level to where even with backups, the num amount of synchronization of systems that has to happen will take weeks, even with good backups. I mean, how frustrating. <laughs> I mean, one, how frustrating to, you know, be in a position where you're trusting an organization and to have this happen and the bad guys are of course really good at what they do, <clears throat> but also to have an organization this large be breached, you know, Mike, you know, when you think about that, you know, it, a lot of the folks who are here in the audience are at critical access hospitals, are at, you know, uh, regional hospital systems, <clears throat> you know, to see a group like Change, you know, have this massive of a breach, you know, is 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 alarming. It is. And, you know, according to the statistics that were rolled up from 2022, which I think are the most recent ones, Cybercrime globally took in about eight trillion dollars. Okay, so that makes it the third largest economy in the world. And you got to ask yourself, when you are trying to go glove to glove with organizations, an ecosystem that has resources like that, you're just not going to win. And this is one reason why the narrative coming out of the federal government, they started with shields up, get everything ready to prevent this stuff from happening to you because it's coming. And they shifted that to what they call shields ready, which means get ready to take the punch because the punch is coming. And it's more now about minimizing your downtime than it is about being perfect at prevention. This is a foreseeable event. Get ready to, you know, take it on the chin and get up off the mat before the 10 count. And so, you know, again, nobody's going to win in a fist fight with, you know, organizations with these kind of resources so smart money now is on preparing for it to happen and minimizing that downtime and now right now we can all see why that's important yeah i want and i want to get back to that preparation question tim you know from your perspective you know thinking about you know how how there's a giant supply chain issue here how, how prepared do you think hospitals and healthcare organizations are you know for something like this uh, my experience out here and what I've been through at the hospitals I was at, uh, they think a lot of them think they're prepared for this, but they have no idea. I think until you experience the consequences of going through this, you really don't have an appreciation for it. Uh, and I know, you know, we've been across the state calling on hospitals. We've had, we've had some success uh, of really uh, getting hospitals up to speed on what the, the consequences of not having a good cybersecurity partner would be. And uh, I think a lot of people are uh, don't take it as seriously as they should take it. And, you know, John, from your perspective, you know, the, the you know, uh, this is, you talked earlier about the consolidation in the industry. And the fact that, you know, having this much power in one company that could cause this much trouble in our nation's healthcare care uh, is a big issue. So two questions for you. One, you know, you know, how, you know, how did that contribute? But but second, you know, do you feel like, you know, people should have been better prepared for something like this with this with this amount of consolidation? Well, again, we're experiencing something like this for the first time. And hopefully we're going to learn from this. When you do have that concentration of mission critical services, every organization will be feeling some impact if they go down. And I think, again, really, we're going to have to ask some really hard questions uh, from a policy and a regulatory standpoint as well. Should organizations get this big without special obligation? If they have, in fact, de facto become the sector utility for the movement of funds, just like in the financial industry, maybe they should be subject to special uh, rules, regs, and cybersecurity quals. And clearly, they have to think about their own downtime procedures 
What is the plan if they go down? Knowing that you're going to impact every provider in the country, every provider. But at the same time, from the receiving end, this is something I've been talking about for years, we as hospitals and health systems must identify every mission critical service piece of technology we have that we depend on to deliver care and then prepare downtime procedures for a loss of those services. Going back to example for Kronos, who knew? Who knew that when Kronos went down, when they suffered a ransomware attack, it disrupted care delivery across the country because people didn't understand in the hospitals that they depended on Kronos for scheduling of clinical staff, not just payroll. So we internally have to have these really robust, dynamic third-party risk management programs that look at every vendor based on their criticality, their criticality. So business critical, mission critical, and most important, life critical, and then prepare a series of downtime procedures for every one of those services, not just paper for the EMR, but robust downtime procedures for every piece of technology, internal or third party, that we depend on for business and for delivering care. And, you know, Fred, um, and for folks who don't know, Fred has been doing, you know, healthcare cybersecurity consulting for 30 years. He was involved in the original writing of the HIPAA security rule. You know, Fred, you know, what John said makes a lot of sense. Is it doable? Is it, you know, one, how do you, how do you figure out where your risks are, um, uh, are concentrated? And then, you know, can you actually do what he said? Yeah. In this instance, this is a real significant problem that has to be solved with policy. We're talking about third party risk, which in most cases is what we actually call fourth party party risk, a third party of a third party. So if I have a payer and they are reaching out to Optum to do the clearinghouse function, I do not maybe have a direct contractual relationship. So how, how as maybe a small healthcare provider, a rural hospital, I have no leverage. It's not like a big hospital chain that's negotiating with a bunch of small providers and having the power to negotiate security into their contracts. A small provider can't go to Optum and say, I need to know everything about your operation and I need to make sure that you are covering all these particular security controls. So you don't have the ability to go tell Optum or tell your payer, pass these contractual requirements on to any fourth party that you have, which is what you should do, but the leverage is not there. There is no leverage for a small provider to do this. How do we solve this? Policy. I don't, I don't see a way solving this without a change in policy. And, you know, Fred, some folks were better prepared because they had incident response planning that, you know, accounted for maybe not change in particular, but for a large, uh, you know, for a large outage of some sort. Yeah, this uh, this was this event in some way has validated our approach to incident response tabletop exercises because we have highly focused on what happens to all of the other functions, not just the caregivers, but the people that keep the back office running, that keep the hospital running. What happens if you lose a payer? We actually have that as one of our scenarios that we run in our tabletop. And we've communicated with a bunch of our hospitals that we've done this for. And every one of them has said this has been the difference, the fundamental difference for them to recover. Most of them are back up and running because we've been through this. We told them you have to be able to solve this problem and made them solve it in a tabletop. This is paying off in 10 times what the effort and time and money put into that tabletop. So I would suggest your tabletops, everybody, everyone at the organization is involved, not just IT, certainly, and not just maybe the CMO, the people that handle the back office that keep the whole thing running. Everybody needs to be part of that. And you know, so I want to go to the chat here because there are a bunch of really good questions. You know, one of them is um is john about all of the new federal standards there so you know in the last year hospitals have been told okay we want you to focus on uh, nist cybersecurity framework uh there's hiccup and then you know we just talked about the new you know uh hhs cybersecurity performance goals called the cpgs you know 
the uh, Nick asks, you know, to what extent will the new standards minimize the effects of these attacks or do they not go far enough? Well, the standards right now that are being contemplated to, to convert to regulation are the CPGs, the voluntary, that uh, we help develop voluntary cybersecurity performance goals, 10 essential, 10 enhanced. The issue there is that, as we've demonstrated, that as we clearly see by Change Healthcare, these CPGs, the regulations only aimed at hospitals. Again, we're saying that hospitals is not the primary source of risk in the healthcare sector, it's third parties and third party technology. So why are we imposing the regulation on ultimately the victim and the, that feels this cascading effect of these attacks? Look, we need to do what we need to do to help defend uh, our hospitals and protect patient care delivery where we have finances and the capability to do that. Um, you would need the entire sector to follow those as we've seen to really make a big difference in securing the sector overall. Internally though, we've got, as I said before, every department has to go and understand, every, every department has to understand what third party technology they provide, they depend on to do their job and develop downtime procedures for that. So will it help? I think, I think it would help if everyone followed it, but the issue for us, for hospitals is we also need the resources. What are we going to do we have a small or rural critical access hospital that does not have the resources to meet the standards. And the federal government says, well, we are going to deny you access to Medicaid and Medicare reimbursement. That'll force hospitals to close. It's not that it is here. Again, I really believe you're punishing ultimately the, the victim and the patients and really not going at the source of the cyber risk. And Tim, I know that's a very that's a frustration for your hospitals as well. You know, we're gonna these these federal standards. You know, here we are looking at them. One of them, uh, you know, says you should focus on your third party risk, but they're not going to be, you know, implemented for the third parties. And yet, you know, for the for Idaho hospitals, there's no funding for all of these. It's it's a no, frustrating and, situation. And half of our hospitals are critical access hospitals, more than half, and some are, you know, more well equipped from a, a financial resource point of view than others. And to do the things that you need to do uh, to minimize your vulnerabilities takes money. I mean, and that's a fact. Yeah, and you know, and so far that money has not been, uh, you know, has not been forthcoming from the federal government. You know, I, I, I you know, Fred, you know, you have done a fair amount of work on those cybersecurity performance goals as well. You and I just did a webinar about them. There's a lot in there about third party risk. Um, I, you know, I wanna go back to that because we've, we've talked about in those cybersecurity performance goals, there are a couple of different ways to think about third party risk. How, how, how should this change healthcare attack change the way people are thinking about third party risk or is it or should we even call it third party risk instead of nth party risk yeah and nth party risk is really it because no one has a singular one stop supply chain almost anymore most people have multiple tiers of suppliers data may be processed in multiple layers by people that you may not know about so at the very least you need to make sure that your uh, suppliers, your the people you're having your business associate agreements with, need to su identify their suppliers and all of the controls that those suppliers are meeting to make sure that they're uh, adhering to HIPAA, right? So the basic level that you can lean into is you need to be HIPAA compliant, you're handling EPHI, tell us everything you can about your HIPAA posture and how you're protecting that data. But the real challenge here is making, what do you do when a breach happens at a third party, right? You need to have a bunch of language in there that not only discusses, you need to tell us within 24 hours, but what are you gonna do? What, how are you gonna assist us in this process to get through this, this attack and this loss of service? And then there's the component of Knowing that you have to report if you are a healthcare provider, and you have a third party who's breached, lost your EPHI, you will be reporting. So you need to make sure, and in this case with Optum, 
we don't even know yet. Is it six terabytes of data stolen with everything from military, U.S. government background, which is a national security risk? Is that all in there? Or is this just a bluff, right, so they can extort more money? But if, in fact, all these records are stolen, we have another whole chapter to the story that kicks off on massive amounts of breach notification. Can you imagine the number of letters that are going to go out as a result of this if, in fact, all these identities were breached. It will be the largest mailing, I think, of uh, identity breach notification in history. Um, and John, you know, I'm sure that's something you've thought about. Um, you know, is this going to end up with, you know, millions and millions of mailings and how to hospital, how, how you know, do you, do you think that's what's next in this whole thing? So I don't want to raise undue alarm, but I think we have to watch very closely. And I think that chapter hasn't been written yet or at least we don't we don't we don't know how it's going to unfold mm -hmm. and that is the big question this group all i will say is that uh black cat alf v has a long history of stealing data while it's conducting ransomware attacks engaging in the the dual layered extortion method very common yet yeah, while before you encrypt systems two main things you do and it's been their MO, they hunt for the backups and seek to encrypt or destroy them, uh, heightening the probability of them having to pay the ransom. And then you're stealing data just in case they are able to restore independently, then you're holding on to that data for ransom payment as well. So we don't know yet. We're gonna have to wait for them to notify as soon as they uncover that, if they're even aware of it. Um, but again, the, it, it also highlights the inherent unfairness, I think, quite frankly, of the OCR reporting system. So if in fact, millions of records have been stolen as a result of this breach, and as we saw, let's say in BlackBot in 2020, there was about 20 million records stolen from that donor management company. Each individual covered entity had to report the breach and had to report on OCR, even though they had nothing to do with it. It was their third party that has suffered the breach. Each covered entity had to send letters to their patients saying, Oh, your data was stolen from a third party we use and it's in again the the as you're a patient reading that you're going to hold the covered entity accountable for that i think so yet again it is the issue is how do we hold that third party accountable and maybe one thing we should look at is in with the federal government instead of each hospital trying to enforce their own individual business associate agreement cybersecurity requirements from a policy point of view, uh, determination is made that if you do business in the healthcare sector, just like if you do business with the federal government, you have to meet these standards. And that way it is, you must meet the certification or standard, and that way it alleviates individual hospitals the burden of trying to enforce these third-party cybersecurity standards. Just my thoughts. Yeah, and, and you know, Nathan, um you know, United Derm is, you know, not, you know, as large as Healthcare of America, right? I mean, it's not, it's not a mass, you know, massive, massive, massive company. You know, you all are going to have to deal with some, you know, losses that come from this, certainly delays. I mean, the amount of time you've spent on all of this, you know, how, you know, what do you think about what John just said in terms of, uh, you know, regulation and how to recover from this? So I had a, have several thoughts as we've been talking here. Um, I think John's point about, you know, covered entities being the ultimate, I guess, sort of visibility to patients, regardless of the nth party that you were using or that, you know, lost that data. Um, you know, I've known instances where that's occurred and just trying to communicate with those third parties who are sending out the initial communications, you know, who all did they go out to? you know, did you get any bounce backs, like down to the nitty gritty of sort of keeping all of that in coordination and understanding what happened is just inherently difficult on top of the fact that, you know, your patients are going to come looking to you, right? Um, regardless of what, you know, where the data or whether you had any direct control over that. Um, I think too, you know, as we think about the risk management piece and the policy and the standard, at least for now, the way that I sort of boil it down in my mind, especially with change healthcare as the specific current example is, 
just looking at all the places where our organization has a single point of failure, right? Just boiling it down to, to just that. And what do you do about that? What are your backup plans around that? And I think change for us at least was somewhat of a unique example in that this was obviously, you know, a single point of failure here, but we also encountered to me, at least some, some surprising difficulty in implementing workarounds just based on how the whole structure is set up, you know, meaning like, Hey, can we go directly to the insurance companies and the payers and like, connect with them directly or do, you know, transact even in from a temporary basis directly with them. And the answer is like, no, um, at least not within the next two to three weeks. Right. And so, so not only was it a single point of failure, but then it was very difficult in trying to implement and continuing, continuing to try to implement workarounds, uh, you know, to resume those operations. Um, and, and as John said, you know, effectively funding um, the caretakers, right? And the, the ultimate goal here is to make sure we're taking care of our patients. Um, and then, you know, the other thing related to that too is, you know, I don't know about other organizations that may be listening or, or even on this panel, but, you know, we're still paying our EMR vendors, right? Like, like I'm sure each of us individually are still paying our premiums to our insurance companies. Right. So like so like funding is going places. But to John's point, you know, our organizations and, and our patients in some cases from the pharmacy perspective are, are the ones that are that are hurting. Right. Now, I'm not saying that the payers and, and change aren't, you know, struggling. Right. But but from a, from our perspective, it's like we 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 need access to that. Right. Somehow, some way. Um, and again, encountering those difficulties. And the last thing I'll say is, you know, in conversations that we had with our um, EMR vendors and other partners and asking that question, how could this happen, right, Jake, where you were talking about earlier, like a huge organization, obviously they're critical to the infrastructure, et cetera. Um, the phrase that kept getting communicated was, yes, we had these things in place. We had our, you know, an IRP, right? We had the basic blocking and tackling in place, but this was an unprecedented event was the quote. And I agree, this is 100% an unprecedented event. But the thing that I'm taking, you know, in my own organization and the thought that comes to me is that's true, but like some of the ways that this thing happened was not unprecedented, right? Like if it was truly a social engineering thing that sort of started the whole thing, like that's not unprecedented. And so I'm not I'm not calling out change or anything like that here. It's more of the conversation back at me. Right. That like, yeah, the next event could be unprecedented. But many of the ways that we see these things start and occur are not. And what am I doing about that? Right. In my own organization. Yeah, I think that's really smart. And, that, you know, and to your to your point about what's unprecedented and what's not. I mean, we know bad guys get in through social engineering. We know that in, uh, you know, in healthcare, the most likely way for a bad guy to get in is not actually through email, but through a software vulnerability. Um, we know that, you know, John earlier talked about the two levels of ransomware. Well, there, you know, there's also the third one. Um, which is, you know, contacting patients when the bad guys start contacting patients, which we have not seen in this case. Um, but, you know, it's certainly something that could happen, right? I mean, if six, you know, six terabytes of data get out there, um, you know, if we see what happened with uh, a healthcare organization in Oklahoma, Integris happen, you know, all of a sudden there's going to be a portal of, you know, patient data where patients can pay, what was it, Fred, $3 to, uh, yeah, so three, $3 to see if your information's there and then 50 bucks to get it out of there. Like that's not, that's already something that the bad guys have programmatized and are looking to scale. Um, and so, you know, that that's not a crazy thing to say that that, that might happen. Um, um, so, you know, that's out there as well. You know, Mike, I, I, I you know, I think that I want to get back to the question of nation states here and the question of, 
you know, who's doing this? I've seen a bunch of comments in the chat here, you know, when I was at the American Hospital Association conference with John Regi just a couple of weeks ago, there were all the questions about why can't we just go take down the bad guys? The U.S. should be doing more to take down the bad guys. This is insert curse word here. Yeah, well, we are. OK, there is there is the federal government has employed a number of uh, initiatives, and one of those is defend forward. And so the, the DOD is actually involved, but it's been the FBI that's been up front melting the infrastructure of these gangs and doing that very effectively. Um, but, you know, kind of writ large, I mean, pull pull back from this and and just look at how destabilizing this is to the country. Right. This is not this is not an entity being hit and some patients being redirected. This is a nationwide event when people can't get prescriptions filled. There's going to be impacts to patient care. And at some point, that's all going to get tallied up. And we're going to look at what happened here. And I have to believe in my conspiratorial brain that there was assistance from a government at least doing the targeting. Right here is an organization that if you take down this one organization, the impact is going to be nationwide and you'll be paid a lot of money. And, uh, you know, frankly, the Fe there is a bigger role for the federal government. The, the difference between the public harm done by these events and the private responsibility to make them not happen is a huge disconnect. So. Yes, we have Defend Forward. We've got the Software Bill of Materials. And if all of your suppliers are required to uh, uh, only employ products that meet the requirements of the Software Bill of Materials so that we're tracking back everywhere vulnerability could happen, the IoT labeling scheme, um, a bunch of other things that the federal government has done, eventually they're going to pay off. Uh, but I, in my mind, I believe, yes, we need to get more sideways with them and we need to be not so much melting their infrastructure uh but you know i hate to say this i mean it's getting to the point where you're thinking about going kinetic you know i i, I mean you know and that's a that's a that's a big that's a big jump there i do want to get yeah. to a couple other things here you know number one you know timothy has a great comment in the chat um uh you know commenting venting overall we really um no, oh, screen just moved for me. Uh, overall, we really need healthcare leadership to buy in and be the chief evangelists of how important InfoSec and third-party risk is to their organization. It's costly in both time and bandwidth, which tends to push it to the side until there's an issue, that is. We need a solid foundation of protections in place. Your org is exposed and patient care will be severely impacted. You know, another story I heard from, from AHA was an organization breached uh, through a different uh, provider and they never even heard from the you know the third party that they had a ransomware attack they only found out when they saw the indicators in their own system you know and you know to that end and to timothy's timothy's point and one thing fred said before is you know how, how you know we've been thinking from critical insight standpoint like how do we help organizations do this fred mentioned before organizations that have done you know incident response planning and tabletops with us have now told us, hey, I felt prepared for this or as prepared as they could possibly be. Um, so one of the things that that we're going to do in response to this is if folks want us to take a look at your incident response plan and help you and do a tune up on it, let us know. And we're going to do a pilot program where we where we start doing those, you know, no cost just to help folks based on this this change attack and some fo and some things we're doing at the American Hospital Association. If you're interested in doing that, um, I'm going to put the survey for this event in the chat, and I put a place in the survey for for folks to say yes, I'm interested in that. Um, and so we'll, we're going to try to pilot that uh, pilot that program. Now, before we get to the survey, I do want to say a couple more things here, which is right here on this page, and we're going to email this out. There's a bunch of really useful links, so when we email this out, those links will be there. But of course, you should take a look. Um, at the CISA guidance and the IOCs, if you haven't, Health ISAC has put out really useful stuff. You should absolutely um, follow John Regi on LinkedIn um, and look at everything AHA is sending out. Um, and I'm not just saying that because he's here. He puts out information very quickly. Um, look at the, you know, if, if this did come from ConnectWise and we don't know, um, you know, take a look at that CVE. 
Um, and of course, those CPGs, the cybersecurity performance goals um, are, are super important there. Um, and so I want to get to the takeaways here. You know, Fred, can you do the takeaways for us? Sure. As Jake mentioned, uh, the number one uh, attack vector for healthcare still is software vulnerabilities. Clearly, uh, if anything is exposed to the internet, if something is exposed to uh, a, a population that you don't have full trust over, make that a priority. In fact, make it an incident if you have any critical or high risk vulnerabilities exposed to the internet. Um, make sure your plan is all about how you're going to coordinate with your BAA. That's a requirement in the HIPAA risk assessment now that your BAAs are part of your IR plan. That means how are you going to communicate? How are you going to work with them in the in this? And you need to potentially include some of them maybe in your tabletop. Um, use a third-party risk management program, a uh, solution, something to identify where risk is concentrated in a supply. So not just this vendor, but this whole thing, everywhere that I do my payment processing, every place that I'm doing my time tracking and management uh, of scheduling and things like that. Who are all these entities that are part of this? It's not usually just one supplier. Think about that next step, third-party risk. Okay, we feel pretty good about that, but everybody's got nth party, fourth, fifth parties. Understand what those risks are. Understand who those people are. And follow the AHA. Uh, as, as Jake said, John has been putting out fantastic real-time communications. I watch it like a hawk because it keeps me informed. So that helps everyone. <clears throat> And, you know, we'd say that even if John wasn't here, you know, let's do let's do a couple of final thoughts here. I don't think we have time to do uh, everybody, but I do want to get a final thought from uh, from John here. John, I'm going to put up um, uh, uh, those are our services. I'm going to put up your email address here, um, you know, as well as mine and Fred's. If anybody needs help, John, why don't you give us a final thought here? What do you want to leave folks with? So regardless of how this unfolds with change right how long it takes so forth use this opportunity right now to think about all your mission critical and life critical services that you depend on and if you really want to understand how you're exposed this is what i say to the leadership and said in this context if you lose the network or your internet connection for whatever reason three simple questions to ask what will work what won't work and what's the plan? And what's the plan? Start from there and build your processes out. And also consider appointing a somebody that has the lead to develop business continuity and clinical continuity procedures for every piece of technology in your organization. And I'll stop there. Jake. Thanks, okay. John. One last thing. Thanks to you, Critical Insight, the whole team for your great support, really in enabling our mission to go forward here. So we appreciate it. Thanks, John. We appreciate it. And uh, I do want to remind folks, we, we do a survey at the end of all of our webinars. We want to know how we did, but also in this one is, you know, that question about the pilot program and whether folks are interested in that. Um, on behalf of John at the AHA, Nathan at United Durham, Tim and all of the Idaho hospitals, uh, and Fred and Mike and everyone at Critical Insight, thank you everybody for joining us. Um, our email addresses are up there if you have any questions and we appreciate you joining us today. Have a good day. Yep, thanks everybody. Thank Bye. you. Stay safe, everyone.